How are you guys Yay, doing? Yay, we can see you. <laughs> Excellent. Right, I can't awesome. see any of you guys. So oh, weird. no. Well, I, I can see you guys. Can you? We can uh, see you. so weird. <laughs> and you have a very red light. Yeah, I, <laughs> I got a new light shining right on me. Is it a bit too bright, do you think? No, it's just quite odd. <laughs> He's in the red light district. <laughs> that that was exactly where my brain went as well. Oh, there we are. I can, <laughs> actually, I'm colorblind, so I actually I actually didn't even notice that. But anyway, <laughs> you, you look good for me. You just look tanned, and from my yeah, that's mind. what I thought. I thought that I looked pretty tanned. <laughs> <laughs> it's been good weather in London lately, so <laughs> <laughs> give it our best shot at asking you some difficult questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now you guys both have your video set up so that you have like your nose at the center of your screen is that how you want things edited together because i currently have lots of space for talking with my hands but no don't worry about it however you want is cool well no, but perfect. i'm like on a robotic camera so seriously oh that's cool yeah that's so cool <laughs> so what do you prefer gareth for the editing bud i don't mind like the, that what i can see now is perfect Okay. Yeah, I'll that's keep cool. It. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Thank you. As long as you're comfortable as well, Pamela. That's oh that's yeah, that important. that was no big deal. I literally okay. pressed a button and the camera moved. <laughs> oh, oh, that is so cool. Yeah. I must and, and also, we we will be at Podcast Movement um, uh, in uh, in Philadelphia. Oh, um, I'll be there as well. Oh, yeah, cool. So, yeah, that's yeah. that's when I that's actually what made me wanted to to speak to you because I saw you were going to be there. Yeah. Um, and I was really so I was hoping we would chat before then so that we got to say hi in person when we're there. So that that would be fabulous. I Ooh. I are you both going to be there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Woo What's up? Yeah. <laughs> Great guys, how's it going, my man? How's yeah, the day? Awesome. Yeah, awesome, buddy. How about yours? Yeah, very good. Thanks, bud. Very good. Just sort of, sort of riding the wave here, you know, in London. Like we, everyone's so excited about the soccer. Like you know, England making the semi-finals, and there's just this really cool vibe <laughs> and energy in the air, and like sense of optimism, which is really cool. So it's yes. been it's been a good one, yeah. Just like seeing, riding the heat wave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But seeing everyone just come together is nice. You know what I mean? Like for a change, like yeah, whatever. Our differences are put to the side for a little bit, and we'll get behind England and support them, which is cool. So it's it's just a good feeling. You know what I mean? Just shows you what's possible, isn't it? Hey? Yeah, so, it does. Yeah, it gives you a lot of hope. You know. Um. So so yeah. Um. But yeah, we uh. You know. Really excited to introduce our guest this week, aren't we? Yeah, geez, we had a great guest uh, this week. And she, talking about heat and suns and stuff, she's a woman who knows so much about all things celestial bodies. Uh, we had a chat to Pamela Gay. She is an, uh, an American astronomer, uh, an educator, a podcaster, a writer. And um, she's also done amazing uh, work uh, in, in the sphere of citizen science. Um, and the various projects uh, projects associated with that. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, we cover so many interesting topics in this podcast. It was like we were just like sitting back kind of mesmerized. You know, we speak, speak about women in science, uh, gender equality, and also, I guess, the, the lack of it too. Uh, what it's like, you know, growing up as, as a nerd and, and being a nerd in general. And getting picked on as a kid just because of your surname. And then even to this day, Pamela has issues where she lives in the Midwest uh, with people calling her Dr. Gay. And it's just kind of a strange phenomenon. And, you know, we also get onto things like flat earthers, which is quite an <laughs> interesting topic, that's for sure. And then obviously life on other planets, we had to ask, ask her about that. And, and also, we just got into sort of so many things about astronomy. There was a good section of it, which was just totally fascinating. And yeah. also, we kind of ended off with, you know, or part of the whole discussion was sort of understanding why space exploration is important in this day and age. So really interesting chat. And um, yeah, so just, I guess, in terms of also a bit of housekeeping, uh, we uh, would just like to 
ask guys and girls to take a moment if you're enjoying our podcast just to rate and review it wherever you want on whatever platform you listen to because that really helps us sort of grow our podcast podcast get it out there and we just really appreciate any sort of time you can give us and and do one of those things will be great yeah guys that'll be really amazing and part of our housekeeping this week we also wanted to just um mention that yeah, finally, we are almost going to the States, uh, less than two weeks now. Uh, Gareth and I will finally be seeing each other in, uh, in Philadelphia, New York. Uh, it's going to be great. We're like super excited. But even more exciting is that we get to see one or two of our past guests, uh, uh, including Pamela. Pamela is going to be at the conference. Uh, and we're really excited to, to meet her uh, in, in the flesh because there's just something special about uh, seeing people in real life, isn't there? And uh, so time's getting closer now, so we're really excited. Um, and just moving on to the chat itself, um, you know, Gareth and I, growing up in South Africa, we, we, we're really lucky. We got to see um, the night sky in all its glory, and both of us have some amazing memories of being immersed uh, under the night sky and the Milky Way. Uh, and it's it's just Pamela just put it, a lot of that into perspective, perspective for us, hey Gareth? Yeah, she did. She really did, you know, and, and it, I guess it also wasn't just South Africa. We, you know, on our travels and stuff, we also spoke about it, like yeah. how lucky we have just to, to be aware, to be conscious of what is up there, you know, and this is something Pamela talks about. She's like, you know, just look up to the, just like look up to the sky, you know, every now and then and sort of imagine what's up there and kind of think big yeah. and, the way she tells the story is so amazing. Uh, she definitely has such a soft, great uh, storytelling voice. And, you know, you combine that with her knowledge, like she's such a smart lady. It's almost like mesmerizing. You kind of want to close your eyes and just listen to her talk, you know, about the stars and about everything else that's out there. So, you know, we hope you hope you sort of do that in the podcast listen to it at night, go sit outside and <laughs> close your eyes yeah. and imagine what she's talking about. Cause it's, you know, really, really interesting. So yeah. So that part of it was fascinating. I must say. Yeah. She, she really has an, like, if you think uh, a beautiful night sky is immersive, uh, I think her voice is like totally uh, immersive. So she's born to be podcasting. That's for sure. And, and educating that way. But um, you know, Unfortunately, coming back down to earth, there were also some realities uh, for her uh, when she was younger and obviously to this day, actually, in academia. But when she was young, she was sort of teased for her surname, Gay. And the crazy thing is that even to this day, there's still people out there, students, and uh, that, that just can't call her Dr. Gay. Like, it's just ridiculous. And she even um, spoke about sort of the... Um, dis the discrepancies between uh, males and females in in the workplace, uh, especially in in scientific academia, uh, and it's it's actually quite shocking because I kind of had assumed that really smart people would would be better at that, but yeah, it turns out that uh, you can have be lots of brains but have a very low emotional intelligence. Hey guys, yeah, absolutely, and you know it's quite sad when she talks about that and. You know, also <clears throat> when she does tell us about her, her upbringing and stuff, like she kind of found her way and her tribe uh, through comics, you know, and mm -hmm. she, that's where she was like most comfortable um, as a kid. And like um, eventually, like uh, late, you know, later on years, she, she started attending like the big uh, comic conferences and was a talk at like one of the huge ones called dragon con, which uh, is just amazing. And she's just like, you know, people sometimes find this comfortable place when they can almost put on a mask or, or a outfit and kind of maybe not be just, or just be somebody else, you know? And I think we can kind of all relate to that, you know, like if you go to like a costume party or whatever, you yeah. sometimes feel like you can just act a little bit differently and, and maybe almost be a bit more yourself because you're not going to be judged because you're in this, um, you know, you've got this sort of disguise on. 
so yeah i mean it was there were so many cool parts to this uh to this chat and like you know she she reminds us about thinking big doesn't she craig like you know there's yeah. so much out there and she she just makes you want to sort of go and learn more and sort of do something like really really cool and like she's very inspiring in her in her way and yeah. that was really really cool yeah her message her fundamental message was really to just think bigger and when we are stuck on earth in all the all of its minutia and all the troubles that we have on a sort of a real micro scale like at the office and your spouse and uh the traffic and stuff and then like you said earlier you just take a moment and look up to this to this to the sky and you just realize there's so much more out there uh you know there's so much more than just these tiny little troubles that we have and i think that's a really great message and i think uh you know both of us walked away from the chat just totally like inspired to to rethink like our place in the our tiny little place in the universe and that's really what it's all about so i think this is a really good time to to take a moment uh to find out what makes pamela gay ridiculously human great stuff well we are here with uh, pamela gay uh, an american astronomer educator podcaster and writer uh thank you for so much for coming on the show with us today oh it's my pleasure to be here great and uh, how has your day been so far what have you been up to it's just been one of those Mondays, desperately trying to catch up on all the things that I attempted to avoid all weekend in this uh, <laughs> pursuit of something I've heard is called a work-life balance. And <laughs> beyond that, uh, like so many people here in North America, it's been one of these, uh, how many fans is required to work when it hits 40 degrees Celsius? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like uh, Gareth at the moment. He's also been sweating it a bit. It's, uh, yeah, our, our planet is displeased with the northern latitudes at the moment. It seems. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been like, I mean, I, I love the heat, but like London, the last few days has literally just been stifling, like doesn't matter how many windows you have open in your house. It's just like, <laughs> whoo, okay. <laughs> yeah, airflow. It's all about airflow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You, you, can, you can almost understand like why the guys then like live in very hot countries or like say very hot parts of Europe and, and wherever else in the world, like they struggle to, you know, to be productive and to work because it's really draining on your energy. Yeah. And and we are not culturally uh used to having like a mid afternoon siesta to escape the worst of the heat and yeah. I don't know about you but post lunch is all of that sunlight poured <laughs> in I just, I just want to die yeah. just kill me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and an afternoon nap is one of the most amazing things that uh, have ever been invented I think. <laughs> Yeah, if only they would come back for all of the world. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's the one thing we can ask for that's free and probably wouldn't have too bad an impact on our bottom lines. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I actually think it would actually improve the bottom line because people's productivity in the late afternoon would probably go up after they've had a little bit of a, a nap, not just try and crack on, you know what I mean? It, exactly, exactly. Al although you would have to move beer 30 a little bit later in the day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, being in Australia, let me tell you, beer 30 is uh, definitely a real thing. <laughs> what is beer 30? I've never heard of it in my life. How, how do you not know about this? I have it's, no idea. Uh, that, that time where you basically look over at your office mates and you're like, beer? beer ah. and everyone as one goes and gets beer oh, I see. Um, yes. oh that's classic oh yeah cool <laughs> makes a lot of so, sense so Pamela well, what does a typical day for you look like uh, and obviously you're super busy and what have you but uh, what does a typical day in the life of Pamela look like oh it's uh, every day for the most part is changing although I am getting more and more punctuated things that are set the same I uh, have the fortune or misfortune to have uh, risen to the point that I actually manage a bunch of other people. So my day usually starts off with 
getting up, checking in on Slack, seeing who all has questions, and then reviewing what's going on in the world. Astronomy is one of these constantly changing uh, subjects where new telescopes, new instruments are allowing us to realize things we had never even imagined on a regular basis. We're, we're pretty lucky that as, as a community, we're tech literate. And back when I was in graduate school, uh, people started putting together a daily listserv of all of the latest astronomy professional articles that you could get in your inbox as they were posted to our free online resource called ArchiveX. So mm -hmm. once I've checked on the humans, then I check on the science and review what's new in ArchiveX, check out the press releases. And I actually started a daily podcast, vodcast to force mm -hmm. myself to do this. <laughs> Then the afternoon is whatever big project I need to cram in that day, whether it be finishing off a budget or finishing off a journal article. Wow. Wow. And, and are your team like uh, mostly remote so you, or do you go into the office at all? Uh, we do have an office. Uh, my team is spread across multiple universities, uh, research centers, and groups. But here in Edwardsville, Illinois, I have another research scientist and a group of students and professional staff that all work together in a old historic building in downtown Edwardsville. Uh, we are across the street from a courthouse where Abraham Lincoln gave a speech. Oh, wow. And it's just a good environment because we're a whole bunch of science fiction, comic book loving nerds who can <laughs> shout each other in um, science fiction slang, I guess, for lack of a better term. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to have to ask you, who's, uh, what's your favorite comic? Oh, right now, I, I don't know if I can say this on the show. I kind of love Bitch Planet. Bitch Planet. Right. <laughs> you can say it. <laughs> you can say it. <laughs> and then, of course, the Sandman classics and Umbrella Academy. I guess I like all of the not quite mainstream stuff. Ah, okay, nice. cool. That's interesting because uh, it's funny. Uh, we have a, a virtual assistant who helps us like with a lot of our notes and stuff. And um, she is uh, like a comic fanatic. And she, she actually just started in a comic book store in, in Spain. Oh, so, wow. so she would just love to know like what you like and stuff. And she'll be <laughs> listening to this now when she's listening to it with a smile on her face so that's cool <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. it, yeah comic books are, are often so ahead in discussing politics and discussing changing lifestyles ahead of almost all the other mainstream content mm. Mm. yes i've never actually thought about that actually you know it's really really yeah that's true i guess they, they, they probably because they, they can broach subjects whatever with almost like no repercussions in a way well, I think they have repercussions just like all fiction does, but I think that the comic book companies, for whatever reason, have been more willing to plow forward and punch a Nazi, mm. um, things yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Pamela, you've actually, talking about comics, you've actually spoken at Comic-Con, is that correct? And can you tell us a little bit about that conference? Well, I, I haven't been to the San Diego Comic-Con, but I've been to a bunch of other science fiction and All fantasy right. conventions. Um, yeah. Dragon Con is probably the Dragon biggest Con, of right. them. And it's this amazing moment because this is a environment where you're surrounded by people who have almost all of them at one point or another gone down the rabbit hole of learning what are the names of all the characters in the Star Wars cantina who <laughs> have completely obsessed over every detail of their steampunk costume or <laughs> in figuring out how to do some dance with the Deadpool team. Everyone <laughs> has their own thing that they've gone down. And they're happy to share with others. One of my favorite evenings was watching science fiction horror writer Scott Sigler totally uh, get into a drunken scientific, non-scientific argument with a paleontologist <laughs> about Jurassic Park and what you can and can't do with your front arms if you're a dinosaur. And so it was this <laughs> completely science-based argument <laughs> and the, these are the 
things that you don't normally get when you go to your local pub in a small town <laughs> anywhere in the world. But For sure. it, it's an amazing experience. And Hex, dorm troopers want to learn science too. Otherwise, their aim will never get better. <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord. That's classic. Yeah, wow, those and, must be super interesting, those... those um... You know, those like to go to, it must be the fascinating. You must like have so many like interesting people that, that come to them. It It's it's an amazing environment because in a lot of times people who otherwise aren't accepted can find their home. Yeah. Uh, there, There's a conference in Boston each year called Eurasia that goes out of its way to be open and accessible to people who have physical disabilities, to be open and accessible to people no matter what their gender identification might be. And this place where you see people openly helping each other out, whether it be, oh, your costume's falling apart, or hey, you look like you're having a bad day, do you want a coffee? Yeah. This, everyone in there, just to compliment people for trying to costume. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an environment that growing up as a nerd with the last name Gay, I kind of always mm. dreamed of yeah. and finally found and... It's it's something we all need to experience occasionally. Most mm. of us don't truly find um, utterly accepting environments very often in our lives. Yeah. Wow. Was it was that the first one that you went to, Pamela? No, I I went to a Star Trek convention growing up, and <laughs> uh, beyond that, it was just always the local little tiny club. Uh, not clubs, little tiny conferences up until I went to Dragon Con for the first time back and I believe it was 2007. And Dragon Con back then was only 40,000 people. It's grown since then. Wow. And I'm not sure anyone knows exactly how many people attend because there's infinite humans and some of them are swapping badges and it's wow. just crazy intense with the people the costumes and everything wow. else um, and you never know quite what you're gonna see I've turned a corner and then there's been someone up on the kind of stilts that put your feet an extra couple of feet off the ground and your wow. arms so that wow. your arms are as long as your legs and they're wow. dressed like aliens and moving with this grace that seems like a puppet and it kind of is but it's wow. a human controlling all of it all at once wow wow that's so cool <laughs> yeah what, what yeah. are some of the what are some of your favorites that you've seen have you got some sort of memories of ones that you thought that those stood out for you some costumes the the first time i i saw someone dressed up as a angel from doctor who where wow. they had sprayed themselves their hair and everything so it looked like they have they had a stony texture wow that was kind of amazing and thoroughly creepy <laughs> then my my favorite costume i think will forever be a sexies from the dark crystal costume I saw that looked screen authentic and it was just wow. somebody's passion project and all the loving detail that went into that and then bringing it to full life yeah. was I I can't imagine I just can't wow. yeah that, that's incredible geez um I, I I just love like dressing up is so cool isn't it like I think yeah. people almost like that's a real great way just to kind of express who you are and to just go into your own little world sometimes, you know, what, as well. You can be, I'm just going to be this character and, and that's cool. I'm yeah. going to be comfortable there. And it's, it's really great. And, and some of the best things that you see are where people take two different characters and combine them violently. Oh. <laughs> um, so you have like Hello Kitty Darth Vader and things like that <laughs> that are just delightful. That's classic. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like you assume a slightly different personality when you are dressed up like that. Hey, and it's and especially if you're in that sort of safe environment, it just must be so liberating to to feel fully accepted no matter how you look. Uh, it, and uh, and then express that like with total confidence, you know. That that is entirely true. And uh, 
to watch how people sometimes come alive when it's no longer their face facing the public. It's a way of stripping away shyness and allowing someone to be who they wish they could be, but don't think they are in everyday life. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Without it's, having to drink a bottle of uh, wine first, you know. You it, could, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Although I, I will say that does quite often happen late in the evening. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's um, sorry, but sorry. No, no. I was just like I was just thinking like um, back to some friends of mine. We went to this uh, this town in the UK like for one of the guys like bachelors, and um, we ended up going to this one bar. You'll know the name of the bar craze it's called a walkabout and oh, yeah. I, th I think literally everyone in the uk goes to this place for their bachelors um and and <laughs> <laughs> and this whole club was just dressed with people that were like dressed up guys were in these massive like outfits <laughs> like literally i don't know how they were even walking around but there was, it was just like brilliant every single person in this nightclub was like dressed up and everyone was just having the best time of their lives because no one kind of knew who anyone was and they're just like going wow. for it and you couldn't, it was just like, exactly. yeah, the <laughs> other personality is cool. <laughs> and that was, that was unrehearsed or unorganized, which is kind of an interesting sort of an aspect to that as well, I guess. Yeah, totally. Like everyone just rocked up, like, you know, in their own yeah. little groups and then there's a massive one of you and it's just like, whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. <laughs> uh, so what did you go as, bud? Uh, actually, no, we all went as, uh, we all went dressed in, I can't even remember, like, oh, we had uh, um, robes, like uh, bath robes, and um, we went as Hugh Hefner's sort of something oh, or another, like, I know it was a bit it was I a thought bit you stupid, were going to but... go to Big Lebowski, but no, you were no, the exact oh, opposite direction. I know, I know, I know, I don't, I don't think I had a choice in that one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! So Pamela, just to give this chat a little bit of context, I um, um, when I moved to the Netherlands, I really started listening to, which is about uh, five six years ago. I really started to listen to podcasts because I had a commute, and and that's when I discovered some of your work. And I first actually heard you on the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, which was um, uh, you know, I really really enjoy listening to those guys and. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's kind of um, kind of starstruck to, to use that term, I guess, um, to see you. Like, you know, it's really amazing because I had it's you know the the medium of voice is so interesting because I've heard your voice so many times on on uh, um, on Astronomy Cast uh, and you know the, the other podcast which we'll get into in a sec. Um, and it's, so it's great to to actually have you here with us. So thanks for coming on. And uh, uh, yeah, how you, you've also met some really interesting people along along your journey, and we obviously love to get into that as well later on. But for our listeners, you know, a lot of people love to hear like where you come from, how you got into what you do, and sort of that journey. So take us back to when you were younger and where you grew up, and uh, and how you got onto this journey of being an astronomer. Well. It's it was one of those paths that I never quite meant to step foot on, but kept landing on anyways. I was a small kid growing up in Southern California where we could see the space shuttle coming in for a landing at Edwards Air Force Base in the early 1980s. And I remember running back and forth between the backyard where I could see this little distant streak nice. in the sky that... I was told was the shuttle coming in and then running into the living room where we had one of those big old classic cabinet televisions and <laughs> I could actually see the shuttle and the chase planes on TV. And wow. um, we, we eventually moved to Massachusetts, so no more watching the space shuttle land, but I had a cheap Sears or equivalent telescope and I drag it outside and try and find things in the sky and I went to space camp but, but the whole time I kept saying oh I'm going to be the first journalist in space oh I'm going to study <laughs> international science policy which this year I'm really glad I didn't actually do professionally because that would have been a mess <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, it it was this this difference between reading, enjoying, and being passionate about space and knowing that it was a career option that I could follow. There just weren't that many role models and kids are constantly told, 
oh, you, you can't do that. You have to be the most amazing blah. And it turns out that, well, there's a difference between working hard enough and actually having to be a genius and I just kept working hard enough that I eventually landed here as an astrophysicist Hmm. and 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 did you like you know what what were your sort of parents like what did they do did they sort of encourage you uh did you have any brothers and sisters (laughs) (laughs) no no I'm I'm an only child and um my mom was a stay-at-home mom my dad was a computer scientist, computer engineer, who wished he'd been a physicist, but uh, family meant you had to earn a living. (laughs) Uh, The sad reality is scientists don't earn anywhere near what computer scientists earn. I, I finally, at the age my parents were when I graduated college, am earning the same amount that my dad was earning when I graduated high school, and those are not inflation adjusted dollars. Wow. Um, Wow. So, uh, yeah, he, he didn't follow his passion to become a scientist. Um, but, uh, I started university dual degree international relations at Michigan state's James Madison college and astronomy and learned that people who are capable of getting up and dressing up for their pre James Madison was often a pre-law program. And I had classmates who dress very much pre-law at 9 AM. And I was just happy (laughs) if I had shoes on. (laughs) And um, culturally, I just, I felt at home with the other astronomy majors. So I dropped international relations. I picked up a bunch of computer science classes and um, have become the kind of astronomer that does my work in computers and this seems to be the place where I'm meant to be and I still get to be a journalist a lot of days thanks to podcasting yeah oh, so cool yeah and, and as a as a kid uh, Pamela you, you self-identified as a bit of a nerd when I per, perhaps at that age nerdy wasn't cool in any way uh, and did that affect you did you know that you were like maybe a bit nerdy or a little different at that time well so yes i i have always identified as a nerd battlestar galactica in the 19 early 1980s <laughs> late 1970s was like my favorite tv show but i was never destined to be like that normal popular kid that we always see portrayed on tv uh Growing up in the 80s with the last name Gay, I got insights into what it means at the smallest level, what it means to be a not mainstream part of society. And um, I just was like, okay, I'm going to embrace the nerd. I'm going to embrace the all the different things and never give in to read the Sweet Valley High books that all of the popular girls were reading. And instead, I just kept reading my Star Trek novels. Mm-hmm. Nice. You were resisted it. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say I resisted it. I'd say that I uh, was too addicted to nerdiness. Ah, there we go. Good. Were, were you like um, sort of like teased and stuff by that, like that, by the other kids at school growing up because you know you loved Star Trek and whatnot? Um. So I mean. Sadly, because it was the 80s, what I got teased about most was my last name. Um, Yeah, it it was. I don't think we often remember how far we've come in just the past 20 years. But living here in the Midwest of the United States, I'm still dealing with a lot of very conservative students who can't say Dr. Gay. No, I'm either Doc, uh, Dr. G. um, And so to be a child growing up pre Ellen, uh, yeah. pre willing race. Um, I was constantly getting, can you do this? Oh, look, you're so gay. Um, oh. just all of, all of the kinds of teasing and harassment of kids who knew from a biased society that it was all right to make fun of this one thing and they saw someone with a last name and in high school when a few people that I went to did begin to come out of the closet I saw just how bad they had it compared to what I'd had as a middle schooler 
And and so that was usually where all the teasing stuck started. Um, beyond that, I got it for being um, brainy and things like that. But I at least was in a school system where being brainy was acceptable. Um, kids go for low hanging fruit. Yeah. There were mm. there were plenty of people who never knew I was into the science fiction because they just never looked that far. <laughs> yeah. Never looked far looked past the low hanging fruit of my name. Yeah. Yeah. And, and 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 you mentioned like being in the Midwest. So there is certainly a, a tangible sort of a conservative uh, I mean you, you notice it still to this day even at university level oh yes oh yes um it's I heard it best described as uh the further you move inland the further you move back in time where wow. here in the midwest you're dealing with significantly more conservative values you're dealing with fashion trends from two or three years ago um Society changes slowly and it requires a new blood, new faces coming in. I don't think in all the years I taught at our local university, I knew any students who were openly gay as opposed to when I lived in Boston and worked at Harvard where there were people who you thought were out just to be cool. <laughs> they were actually heterosexual. Uh, <laughs> and... And I will never slight someone for staying in the closet. Those students had all the bravery it took just getting Jeez. out of bed each morning. But there is unfortunately still sexism, still racism, still homophobia. All those things are alive and they aren't as well as they used to be, but they certainly aren't an ICU. Yeah, wow. wow. Isn't it like sad, crazy, stupid, all those sort of words that like, you know, we have on one end of the spectrum here, you are talking about stuff that's going on in our galaxy, like that is just absolutely phenomenal. And then on the other side, you have people who still have a problem with your surname. It's like cheap as we, you know, ridiculous. We, just, ridiculous. <laughs> we haven't moved on at all. <laughs> it's, it's an extraordinarily strange dichotomy, especially working on the Internet. I, I do a fair amount of live streaming. We record our astronomy cast po podcast live on YouTube and the daily space I do live daily on Twitch. And in both of these environments, I get people coming in and making strange comments because of my name, looking, making strange comments because I'm a female. But it's, it's also the kind of thing that um, can be used as a test particle. I yeah. know that one of my tweets has gone viral this, as soon as I get the comment, oh my God, her name's gay. She's so gay. Oh, that no means ways. that my tweet, which is usually science related, has reached new audiences. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, you have to take it both ways. And I just hope that if if I can get people to think more scientifically, to think more logically, that maybe they'll realize that all of their emotion-based bigotry and biases are something they need to figure out how to look beyond. If if someone as safe as a white chick in middle of America can be seen as something worth making fun of on the internet, what are people who mm. who are black people of color who aren't identifying as a man going to be dealing with. Yeah, jeez. And yeah, that's a good point. Wow. so so I'm I'm that safe person that bring it at me. I can take it. Uh, I'm I'm <laughs> safely ensconced in the Midwest. I know it's going to be a pain in the butt for anyone to get here. <laughs> so maybe maybe I can educate people about more than just science. And do you ever give these people like sort of fuel for the sort of fire or do you like how do you respond to them when they say it? you just give them nothing what's your strategy it it usually depends on exactly what they're doing i i have a fabulous group of mods we like to joke that they use thor's ban hammer on trolls <laughs> and and we let people get one or two not massively insulting comp comments out so to to give you a specific example we had a bloke at least that's what i'm assuming based on his username come in on saturday and uh 
was making all sorts of comments about homosexuality where I wasn't sure if he was coming out or making fun. They weren't entirely coherent. Mm. And so the response to something like that was, um, it's actually my name and uh, you're welcome here, but let's talk about planets. (laughs) And so you start off with, let's see if we can get them to change topics Mm. and maybe realize, hey, space is cool and more interesting than making fun of or making weird comments no one understands. Uh, If they keep going, um, then we just ban them. Uh, You start with a five-minute ban and then increase to ban for life. (laughs) Uh, Flat earthers are just as much as a concern, and we try and take same approach with flat earthers uh just making offhand comments about because our planet is spherical we see blah without actually saying Mm -hmm. no you're wrong just because the earth is round we see and then if they refuse to shut up ban hammer (laughs) yeah bang (laughs) Uh, i'm I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you actually mentioned uh, flat earthers because it's so it's i was on facebook (laughs) about a year ago right and um I've, I'm like going through this or been going through this stage where I'm like, okay, anything that I've ever believed before, I'm like open to to discuss, you know, like if if you can give me a good reason for it. And uh, one of my mates, good schoolmates, he, start, he posts this thing about the earth being flat. And I'm like, are you serious? Like, <laughs> and um, I'm like, cool, like tell me about it, you know, like, and I just start following yeah. this, this uh, sort of trail of like comments and whatnot and, and like really heated discussions. Some guys getting very sort of scientific about the fact that it is definitely flat. Um, and then I got added to this WhatsApp group and every morning I would wake oh up. Oh my gosh. Every morning I would wake up and there would be like, I'm not joking, like 60 messages. And, and eventually I was like, guys, like, it sounds like you have a good argument, but this is not for me. I've got to get all this chat. Yeah, but it's amazing. Yeah. Like, you know, they have conferences and all these sort of things. Like, is, is there any validation to what they say whatsoever? Like, I mean, that has to, that's my, no, of course not. I mean, no. it's just fascinating that they might believe it. I, part of me is really hoping that the, the flat earthers are mostly people who are just uh, having a good time messing with scientists to see how to get them to react because as trollish and rude as that is, I'd rather believe that people are assholes than that they're that naive about reality. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm just worried that there are a few charismatic people out there who are just trying to rile things up for sport who are perhaps convincing those who are less thoughtful that... Yeah our world is flat and that kind of terrifies me that there are people out there being convinced this is real yeah yeah no totally and, and, and they've and they're avid like you said they've they're very um uh, virile and very uh energized uh, yeah. with this whole thing and and that is the sc- it's totally scary like you say there's, there's probably a few people who are having a good laugh and then people pick up on the stuff and and run with it uh, and but then they really believe it, and they'll fight tooth and nail to make the argument for it, which I, it's just fascinating to me as well. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, terrifying, fascinating and yeah. terrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm sure yeah. when I'm sure when he if he listens to this, he's I'm gonna have uh, oh. someone to deal with. You know what I mean? He's gonna oh, be like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I didn't want to really go there, but just briefly, like I know where where you situated in that we and our guest from last week, we touched on it a little bit, um, was teaching the controversy around uh, evolution and that it's at schools and that. Is that something that is still like happening in that area? Is it still a contentious oh, yeah. issue and what have you? Yeah, it's, I, it's contentious to the point that at one point I was team teaching a science methods course for early elementary school majors. So these are people who are someday going to be teaching small children 
And this one semester course was meant to be an introduction to all the physical sciences. So it had a bit of chemistry, a bit of physics, a bit of astronomy, uh, all rolled up into one. And they had me doing the physics astronomy. They had someone else hired to do the chemistry. And one day, which was my day to teach, I don't even remember what the initial question was, but a student asked a question where the appropriate response was, well, uh, from what we understand from Big Bang cosmology, and I started explaining what Big Bang cosmology is, and I didn't get very far into my explanation before the other teacher of the class, this is a PhD chemist, was mm -hmm. like, how can you call yourself a good Christian and say, d just what? started with the blank assumption that I'd be a Christian because I lived in the Midwest. Oh, my goodness. Continued on that I, of course, would have to be a young earther. And, and I kind of got the, the I am going to rule this room body language <laughs> and said, wow. we can discuss this later outside <laughs> of the classroom and use the rest of the class to explain the three major arguments for Big Bang cosmology. Um, we weren't actually allowed to teach in the same classroom anymore after that, Wait. but I stand by that I did entirely the right thing. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. You totally just like straw man you and 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 just yeah vilified you in front of everyone and and it's very hard to come back from from that when you've you know in front of everybody as well it's just like it's such a horrible um, and such a insincere technique of of having an, a, a conversation an argument you know it's just ridiculous even if you do have your beliefs there's yeah. better ways to go about it and that just shows that that insecurity, isn't it, in my opinion, anyway. And emotional arguments, at least with some argument, with some audiences, do lose you the story. Mm. In this case, I had a student who asked a earnest question. I gave them a thoughtful answer designed to make no one feel stupid. I was explaining all of my terms. And here he comes out angrily from the wall that he'd been leaning <sighs> against. And... Sometimes the best thing you can do is respond, we can have this conversation later mm -hmm. and just drop the person. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and yeah. and that if I had gotten shouty back, mm -hmm. yeah. It would no longer have been a teachable moment. So yeah. instead I turned it into a teachable moment and shared with my students why it is scientifically based on evidence. Mm -hmm. that I hold that our universe is more than 13 billion years old. Yeah. Wow. So, so did, did you end up having the, the chats with him afterwards? Uh, yes, this was a chat that we ended up having in front of the uh, <laughs> chair of the uh, department this course was taught for, and the verdict was he and I would never be in the same room again. <laughs> uh, <Wow. laughs> so, yes. <laughs> do, do you feel like you're in that environment that you're in the almost in the minority? It's almost how I that's the from a person outside of the states and in the area. It almost feels like you the one that has to almost explain yourself. Do you know what I mean? There, there luckily are a lot of faculty and academics in this part of the country who do live evidence-based academic lives where many of us are people of faith, many of us uh, have those things outside of academia that are neither proven nor disproven mm. that we want to believe are true. But in terms of our science, in terms of our research, we follow that straight and narrow evidence-based facts to sure. what we do our research on. What makes it complicated is when the faculty are significantly more uh, liberal than the students. I, I once showed wow. up to teach physics for scientists and engineers. It was a class of 70 odd students. And I was the only one in the room whose hair was not a natural color. It was the week before Dragon Con. My hair was bright red. <laughs> I was quite pleased with myself. They thought there was a crazy lady teaching. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, classic. Uh, so, so I was just wondering, going into the field that you're in now, like it, 
Is it a male dominated sort of field or industry? And how did you find like getting into it? Um, was it a challenge for you to sort of get accepted and that sort of thing? At, at the senior levels, astronomy is running about 11% women. Wow. And uh, in my undergraduate classes, there was one other female physics major. I was the female astronomy major in my year. And there were, uh, in our physics astronomy graduating class, there were 11 boys. Um, and the statistics have gotten worse ever since. It's, it's one of these things where when I was younger, there were always programs pushing women to go into science. There were periodic moments. Uh, I had a physics professor who said in high school, I guess physics teacher, who said when I was in high school, he was giving me a C for my own good to help prevent me from going into science in wow. college because I didn't have what it took as a woman. What? No ways. These, these are the things you periodically hear. And at, at that point, the biases that I dealt with when I was young were mostly, but not entirely, but mostly ones of, oh, it isn't a thing for women. As I've gotten older, I've had to deal with, with more complicated things. I uh, had a young postdoc out to visit to rent an apartment before joining my staff here in Illinois uh, when I was still working at the local university. And uh, she and some of the young physics faculty and one of the senior physics faculty joined uh, the two of us to get beers at the end of the day. And one of the young physics faculty looked at all of the things I was doing research wise and the grants that I have and and asked, why, why aren't you a tenured professor? And the tenured professor uh, answered, oh, she has tits. We don't give tenure to tits. No way. Yeah. And, Whoa. and you just listen, you just listen. And five months later, I was preparing a talk on how we need to fight to make our world better. And one of the things I brought up just as the smallest part of this talk was the effects that it has on people to hear comments like that and how it makes it mm. more difficult for us just because of the knock against the self-esteem. And I had a dean demand I get fired for talking about it. What? And you deal with these things over and over and you deal with the fact that you get groped at a conference and you try and report it and the response is, oh, well, yes, you guys are out here for the conference. It actually happened. And they find a way to say that the conference isn't responsible and because it's a colleague from another university, the other university doesn't Jeez. care. Wow. And so the older you get, the biases that you deal with they they change and it's no longer just the straight to your face oh women can't do this it's now tits don't get tenure it's now let me grab your butt and watch as no one does anything no ways. and we recently had a woman leave the field of astronomy very publicly after she was harassed as part of just trying to submit a paper to be published and what? no one was willing to step forward and say this is wrong we need to be judging each other in a way that maybe doesn't take into account our names maybe doesn't take into account any Jeez. anything that identifies our gender so that we're getting judged strictly on our merits this is supposed to be a meritocracy we're supposed to be judged based on our capabilities, not our curvature. Yeah. But they always talk about why are there so few women? And I've heard people ranging from Larry Sumners, who used to be the president of Harvard and went on to be Obama's economic secretary, uh, talking about, well, maybe women's brains just aren't programmed correctly. What? He's different wording, but it boiled down to that. And people are constantly trying to identify what is wrong with the women, that they dedicate too much time to their children. They, they do all of these things to the detriment of their career. And I think what we're starting to find across all fields, and, and Harry Weinstein's case in Hollywood is an excellent example of this, that women 
deal with so much harassment, whether it be sexual harassment or just plain bullying, that at a certain point, it's either you swallow your self-esteem and just take it so that you can keep working in that field you're passionate about, which is what so many actresses did, or you just leave. You just leave. Mm. And I have so much respect for the women who have left and found a way to be happier and be their better selves. And instead of saying there's something wrong, we need to say there's something wrong with the field, not them. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do we how do we stop this stuff or at least get it out there? You know, there's I mean, it's obviously seems to be starting a little bit now, but it's, it's just way too common these days still. You know, we're not just talking about, you know, against women, but racism and all that sort of stuff. It's all it's all kind of a lot of it's in the same brackets, you know, buckets. Sorry. Yeah, it's it. I, I completely agree. Uh, we have to work across the board while we may only be. Uh, roughly 11% women in astronomy, uh, at any given moment, you can name all of the PhD holding women in astronomy on your hands. No way. There, there's only been under 100 PhDs given to people of a color in astronomy, period, in the United States. What? what? And yeah, so I'm shocked. Jeez. It's it's these are the kinds of things I think everyone would be shocked at if they knew, but we're not talking about them. There are so many efforts to get women into science. We need efforts to instead of working to get more people into science. I think everyone is a small child, loves dinosaurs, loves space, likes to blow yeah. up things with chemistry sets. <laughs> people innately love science. Yeah, we need to make that acceptable. And then we may need to make it absolutely unacceptable to show anything related to hate within the workplace. Yeah. We need to make it unacceptable for professors to touch their students. Yeah. We need to make it unacceptable for so many different things to occur. And it can't just be women calling out. It can't be just minorities no. calling out the problems. I, I think the best solution I've ever seen was a cartoon that depicted a woman in a hijab being harassed on a subway and someone walked over in the cartoon and pretended to be her friend and was like, hey, how's it going? And just put themselves in the situation to end the situation of harassment. That's step one is mm. end it in the moment. Mm. Part two is having the appropriate authority figure step in and make it clear that behavior is unacceptable. And part of that is is also putting it out in the open that this is go what's going on. Uh, here in the United States under Title IX, which is the set of federal regulations that govern how uh, things are supposed to be treated with equality in the academic systems. Uh, universities are called upon to handle rape, sexual harassment, and other such situations within the universities rather than going out to the police for criminal um, circum for criminal investigations. This means that if you have a student that's raped in the dormitories, the university figures out how to prosecute instead of the police. Yeah. What often happens is the woman is asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement, is asked to make it all secret, and mm. the man and the woman live in the same dorms forever, and he gets a slap on the wrist, Whoa. maybe ejected for a semester. The same thing happens at the faculty level, where students can report, I've had these things happen to me. They're asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement, which if they go back on has financial penalties. What? And the male faculty member or female, females harass as well. There is a case last week of a German, as a prof of a professor in Germany harassing uh, minorities in her institution. Um, the the victims are asked to sign non-disclosure agreements while the perpetrators continue being their best perpetratory selves that that needs to end and there are people here in the u.s at least trying to get title nine amended that when someone is found guilty through an investigative process they actually uh that goes public so this wow. will no longer be a completely hidden circumstance yeah 
Wow. The, the asymmetry is unbelievable there. It's just ridiculous. Yes. Like you can't even believe it. But it, it just, I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm really naive because I feel, you know, this is the highest level of academia. Uh, I would have thought there would be a sort of a much higher level of understanding or deeper understanding of these things and, and sort of a, because it's clever people there, people that are like, you know, it just makes no sense to me that the, that's, it's so rough uh, at, well, at that level. Emotional intelligence and academic intelligence have nothing to do with one another. We all know that person who is so smart and so socially incompetent. Mm -hmm. And while there are amazing people, uh, Nobel laureate John Mather, who is one of the scientists behind the James Webb Space Telescope, is the nicest, most amazing human being and one of the most brilliant alive. Uh, you do get to combine all of these things into one person now and then. But <laughs> that's, <awesome. laughs> that's that's not always the case. Um, and And at the end of the day, uh, we had this amazing growth in astronomy and space science after uh, the space era began with the Apollo age bringing in huge numbers of people, mostly men, coming out of the Mad Men generation, mm. where it was a different time. It was different socially acceptable norms. And those people are all still around for the most part because the average age of retirement in astronomy and space science is over 70. Mm. So see, when yeah. you have these people, it's like you accept your racist uncle sometimes, even though you shouldn't, mm. because that's their generation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I think in academia, that generation has taught their proclivities to younger generations. So it's mm. still going to be a while to weed it all out. But we're trying. Yeah. We're trying. Um, I'm yeah. I'm just uh, now what you just said about, uh, you know, going back in time uh, and, and Apollo and stuff. There, there was a movie that came out recently. Um, Hidden I'm, Figures. One of the best I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. Hey, how good is that film? Like, whoa. And, and the book is amazing if you're not a film watcher and you want more details. Oh, cool. And many of these women are still alive, still telling their stories. And what they went through was that was true that actually happened and nasa continues to be one of the few places where it's consistently ahead of its time we have uh, out at the jet propulsion lab which is funded by nasa but isn't actually a nasa center uh the women who operate the mars rovers mars rover drivers are are largely <laughs> women and this cool. is because awesome. it's a job that lets you go home and pick your kids up on time from daycare so cool. Cool. Uh, that work-life balance is something that nasa as a federal agency has allowed its scientists to find uh, so, well, yeah, that movie shows that there were still problems. Yeah. There were less problems there than those individuals would have encountered just about anywhere else. Wow. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, leading by example, again, yes. uh, as a big uh, institution, that's, I suppose, part of what you were asking, Garrett, like, how do you deal with this? And I guess that's a nice way to start is seeing the big the big players actually making changes. Like, uh, yeah, that's really cool to see. And, and it doesn't have to be only the big players. Uh, one of the most uh, influential things I've seen is Brian Gainsler, who he's just in his 40s. He's a young guy, but he's a top-notch researcher. He's worked on all the biggest exploding stars discoveries you've probably heard of in the past few years. Uh, while he was director of Sydney Observatory, he put into place rules like, hey, if you call men by their first name, you need to call women by their first name. If you call men by their last name, you have to call women by their last name because there is this <laughs> situation where you'd see the guys referred to by their last names, which mm. is an honorific, and women referred to by their first names, which is a diminutive. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. He said that people needed to schedule all of their meetings so that they would be done in time for people to go pick up uh, whoever they needed to pick up from daycare, whether it be elders or children. So cool. 
And and he did this at one small observatory. He then took that exact same thing with him to the University of Toronto, where he now is. And he's inflicting these same wonderful policies on international collaborations. And mm -hmm. sometimes all it takes is one person saying, change starts here. Yeah. It's awesome, yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. So, so, sorry, but go ahead. No, 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 you go. But I was, I was like, it's like, time to get on to some exciting questions <laughs> yeah, about totally space so. and stuff yeah. like <laughs> but no just just before we we move on there have you ever mm -hmm. met any of those ladies uh, from hidden figures by any chance i uh, no i haven't um uh, my my direct supervisor was able to go out and uh meet the the woman um oh i'm blanking on her her name, the the leader of the group, she was able to go out and Catherine, oh man, I'm forgetting her last name. <laughs> she was able to go out and meet the one whose first name is Catherine um, and present her with uh, my society. Uh, I, I work for the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, which does education research and uh, has a series of awards we give out every year. And she was able to go out and give our first uh, ABC Walker Award, which is named after a prominent uh, space scientist who was uh, one of the first black space scientists. He was able to, she was able to go out and give the award oh, named in his cool. honor to the woman whose first name was Catherine. And I can't remember her <laughs> oh, last name. I hate myself right now. Show notes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, that's so cool. Well, you know, talking about education, Pamela, you've um, obviously uh, an avid communicator and um, and you're passionate about communicating science to people like us and, and obviously many others. Um, I, obviously, podcasting was something that you picked up really early. I mean, you, you 2005, uh, you yes. sort of were podcasting and that's incredible so how, how did you get into that journey and and how do you um, use that medium to to get disseminate an, an idea or, or your science well first getting into it was just a matter of standing in the right place at the right time I was working with the American Association of Variable Star Observers and had gone out like several of my colleagues to the American Astronomical Society meeting that year. And one of the other guys from the AAVSO came up to me and he's like, on the flight over, I read in Parade magazine about how Christians are using this new technology <laughs> called podcasting to uh, evangelize computer scientists who live on their computers. Wow. We need to use this technology for astronomy and you have a great voice let's do this <laughs> and, and he rounded up another one of our colleagues from the AVSO and the three of us a couple of weeks later on February 14th 2005 launched the Slacker Astronomy podcast and the technology for podcasting had only been invented in October of 2004 so wow we Jeez. were the first Early science adopters. and technology. <laughs> yeah, they, they had to create the the science and technology tag for us in the podcast directory. Cool. We oh, were pre-iTunes podcasting. Wow, that's so amazing. Oh, what, what was before iTunes? Uh, so so Adam Curry, an old MTV VJ turned uh, tech evangelist, uh, uh -huh. he had his podcast directory. There was Podcast Alley. Uh, people initially started out listening to these things on these little tiny iRiver devices that were the size of a couple of batteries and an inch of technology. And <laughs> it was a different day. And then uh, we had to go everywhere and explain what a podcast is. And it's like, <laughs> well, it's talk radio, but in your pocket <laughs> and your computer will automatically download it. This was before we had the interactive web the way we do today. Uh, we called at that point podcasts new media. We called YouTube new media because yeah. this was the cutting edge stuff. And now you, you can't throw a USB drive without hitting a podcaster. <laughs> it's yeah, true. Yeah. It's, it feels like we're still dealing with that, to be honest, sometimes. You, you're like explaining what a podcast is to people. I'm like, how is that even possible? <laughs> it, it, it's true. Uh, hopefully that will change now that Android has a theoretically really good native podcast app. Uh, 
getting more access will help. One of the things that that we deal with living in the nations the three of us are in right now is uh, there's cheap and affordable bandwidth. But Mm. I remember when I visited Cape Town, I wasn't Mm. paying per 24 hours for hotel internet. I was paying by the megabyte for hotel internet. And when you have those limitations to access, being able to go to the local library, download a whole bunch of podcasts, and then walk around not connected to the Wi-Fi and consume content, that's where it's at. And so we're seeing Mm. a lot of people in the developing world, as well as commuters, which is how you Mm. originally heard me, these are the two audiences. People on exercise bikes can tune into YouTube, but that person driving their car hopefully isn't. Yeah, Yeah. that's true. Interesting. <laughs> um, so you just touched on on Cape Town there, and I was reading like I think it was on your web page uh, on your blog that you one of your greatest memories was actually in Cape Town, and yeah, I mean it was like a whole lot of astronomers getting together, and you were looking at I can't remember the exact story like certain stars, and you you had like a almost like a sleepover, and then you woke <laughs> up in the morning and you just and, and, yeah. It, it, it wasn't quite a sleepover. So so there there was a group of us who had gone to the city of Cape Town uh, to attend a meeting or, organized by Kevin Govinder, who runs the uh, Office of Astronomy for Development out of the university there. And after this amazingly successful several-day-long meeting, a group of us went up to Sutherland, which is where the South African Large Telescope, as well mm. as a bunch of other telescopes, are located. Mm. And there was this amazing uh, little visitor center that had its own telescopes, and we sort of commandeered those. And <laughs> I learned that if you look at the Tarantula Nebula through an amateur telescope, it actually looks like you're staring into the face of a spider, which is a bit disturbing. Wow. <laughs> but at, at a certain point in the night, we decided we wanted to stay up and watch the sunrise. So we walked up oh. the mountain from the visitor center and found a place beside the road that we knew the, the astronomers would be driving down when they packed up for the night. And we just set up to watch the sky rotate, to watch the Amazing. Milky Way set, the sun rise. And As it began to get bright, we realized we'd sat down in the middle of a herd of springbok. No way. Cool. Yeah. (laughs) These are, for those of you who don't know, it's like a South African kind of deer, for lack of a better description. (laughs) They have horns. And they're just these adorable, spry little critters. And one of them came over, and one of my colleagues had a camera that was on an automatic timer and was taking a new exposure every few minutes and the noise the camera made the spring brought came up and was like flaring its nostrils and smell what was making that noise (laughs) wow what a cool experience it it was truly amazing and i fell in love with the wine country and i desperately want to go back um so please anyone in south africa who's listening i just need you to cover my travel <laughs> rate. Um, to go and i will science you for all i'm worth awesome <laughs> <laughs> it, it actually i got goosebumps listening to that i like that african um dawn and uh the smells and i can i can just you, you totally took me there i can totally picture it and uh what a beautiful experience was it a good um let's say uh, uh milky way setting was it good good oh, evening clear skies and it it was perfect it was one of those nights where i i'd never seen the southern milky way and we could see the dark paths in it which have been named the emu the ostrich the llama by so many different southern hemisphere civilizations and We'd all read in magazines how, about how people found pictures and the dark paths through the Milky Way, but to get to see it was amazing. And I don't think I've ever been somewhere quite as, as dark as it was out there in Sutherland. Wow. And it, it was definitely an experience that I wish everyone could have because no one would want to turn lights on at night ever again. Oh, wow. wow. Did, did, That's so cool. did you say that it is actually one of the darkest places in Earth on Earth or something, or is that just like part of the story? Just felt well, like it, it was. It's 
I think it's the darkest place that I've ever been. It is one of the darker places on Earth. It isn't the darkest place on Earth. There are some cities off on the horizon. Mm. I think currently the darkest places on Earth are in the middle of Australia, because let's face it, there isn't very much in the middle yeah. of Australia. Uh, and then, of course, up in the Chilean mountains and the uh, islands um, that are between uh, Europe and uh, Africa, where we've been building observatories for many years, these are the Canary Islands. So there are some amazingly dark places out there. This is one of the darkest, which is why there's a telescope there. Mm -hmm. um, but we're getting very careful around the planet to identify the places that are dark and to make them dark sky preserves. It oh, We don't awesome. often think, but... I don't know about you guys, but when I was little, I could see so much more of the sky than I can mm. see today. And this is just as we've built more gas stations, as we've built more Walmarts and Targets and Quickie Marts and shopping malls, <laughs> lit all these things up. It's stolen our stars. Yeah. And so we need these places where we can go and we can take our children and we can go camping and just lean back in a hammock and look up and see, <sighs> see everything. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I was now when you say that it reminds me when I was in Colombia, I was in this uh this town, it's well this this town near Santa Marta, all these mountains near Santa Marta, which is like sort of northern Colombia and I promise you I looked up to the sky the one night. It was actually the night of my birthday and I just saw like the most incredible stars I've ever seen in my entire life and it was just reminding me exactly of what you were saying now. It was just special, really special. And and it's something I truly hope everyone gets to experience at least once because looking up and realizing that those moving lights are satellites, looking up and realizing that these things you only see out the corner of your eye, well, that's because your averted vision is more sensitive and those are the star clusters and maybe it's the Andromeda galaxy just waving at you in your peripheral vision asking so. you to go get binoculars and take a better look <laughs> this this is this is something that makes us realize just how small we are in the grand scheme of everything yeah, yeah. i love that. Uh, that that's that's totally that feeling like um when you've seen that milky way uh in in that in all its glory uh with the naked eye you you totally just you feel immersed in and and how uh, we're part of something bigger, you know. Without without sounding too sort of esoteric about it, it's just that we're just tiny little things in this big journey, and it's 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 such a cool feeling, isn't it? <laughs> and and it, it inspires you to make up stories. Uh, both <laughs> yeah. of you have been to the southern hemisphere and probably gotten to see the large and small Magellanic cloud and. The first time I saw them, uh, these these are two nearby irregular galaxies. This means that if you look at them through a telescope, it kind of looks like a lightning bug on your windshield that had a very bad day. <laughs> and when you're in the southern hemisphere, you can see this swath of the Milky Way that looks like someone spilled milk across the sky. And the large and small Magellanic clouds are the splashes. Or uh, oh. I always imagined them as... If if a giant grabbed two handfuls of stars and just threw them sideways, <laughs> that's, that's where so they gross. went flat in the sky. This inspiration to make up stories always gets me thinking about the ancient Greeks. Candles were expensive. They had the sky. Yeah. And mm. so they sat up late on their insomniac nights and watched the heavens. Mm. And it it's amazing to think these are the same stars more or less a few of them have exploded mm. uh these are the same stars more or less that humanity has always been looking at oh, wow. i'm wow. just i'm just like totally fascinated by like you know just <laughs> just listening to what you're saying now so I, the, our, Craig and I, we always like talk a little bit before the chat. We're like, oh, what are we going to ask? What are we going to ask? <laughs> and <laughs> I, I, one of the things like I wanted to ask you is I was re I've been reading uh, Brian Cox's Human Universe. Uh -huh. And um, he talks about it like there have been billions of galaxies, right? How, how do we even know that there are billions of them? Like, how can you see them? How, how do you measure them? It just, it almost seems like... 
impossible you know what i mean we kind of don't even know our one it seems that well but there's right. billions of others <laughs> <laughs> at, at, at a certain level we have to rely on uh these basic cosmological principles that tell us everything is the same everywhere we aren't in a special place and that if you can get far enough away and look down on our universe uh, from some fourth dimension, that you'll see there's the same density of galaxies in all directions. Now, we know that the reality is our universe is kind of constructed like a sponge. It has voids. It has overly dense bits. But knowing the density of the universe where we are, and looking out at the cosmic microwave background starts to put some limits on our universe. If our universe were such that we are able to see much more than four or five percent of it, then light would have had a chance in some directions to have made it all the way around so that we could look in two different directions on the sky and see the exact same thing. We, we live on a a uh, surface of a three-dimensional donut that exists in a fourth dimension. So if you can imagine standing on a donut, you can shoot two lasers out of your two hands and those beams will stay parallel going around each other no matter what direction you point. Some of the paths are shorter, some of them are longer, but the light mm. rays always get to stay parallel. Our universe, in all of its three-dimensional goodness, sitting on top of this fourth-dimensional donut has that same property of light rays staying parallel. Hmm. And since we don't see the same objects in any direction, we don't see the same pattern in the cosmic microwave background in any two directions, that tells us that we're only seeing the smallest fraction of our universe. Hmm. So we take what we're able to see, assume that what is out there beyond the edges of our our telescopic vision beyond how far light has had a chance to travel. We assume that everything out beyond the edges of what's visible is the same as what's here. And we calculate outwards and mm. assuming a finite universe. Well, that tells us that best case, we're seeing 4% of what there is. Mathematics wow. it out, but hmm. that's best case. We could wow. be seeing 0.4%, 0.04%. It could be infinite. We don't actually wow. know that answer. <laughs> that is super interesting. And and so seeing as we're on the, the the part of the show where we get to ask you some questions now, because <laughs> this is super <laughs> interesting, um, we're, people talk about us being stardust, and um, I'd love to talk about um, two things, uh, supernova, supernova, you know, we sort of basically, come from explosions and so number one can you tell us what that really means uh, and number two is it is it an exploding or is it a supernova is that a potential uh, for us uh, where we sit in earth is somewhere is there a star close by that potentially could go supernova and would it affect us okay so you've you've got three parts there so I'm going to try and weave them all together <laughs> So yeah. we, we are made of dead star stuff, uh, just like you might have heard the phrase ashes to ashes or people are worm food uh, <laughs> in relationship to recycling mater material here on the earth. When stars die, their material gets released out in many cases, not all cases, and recycled for future use. The carbon in your body probably came from a star not too different from our sun in many atomic cases, where a star was burning in its center carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and when it died, it exhaled its atmosphere, forming a planetary nebula. And through the eons, that material expanded out, mixed in, got recycled into new generations of stars. Now, other elements came from other kinds of death. Uh, if you're wearing a gold ring, that material probably came from two extraordinarily compact objects called neutron stars that merged into a single object. So to, to give you a sense of what I mean by compact objects, neutron stars are roughly the size of Manhattan Island in diameter. So think 
big city, but not mega city in diameter and are more than two times the mass of the sun. So cram wow. more than two times the mass of the sun no way. into a volume that you could balance on Manhattan and successfully completely destroy. Uh, <laughs> and you have a neutron star. Wow. Take two of these objects, merge them together. It's going to give off a flash of light, a flash of gravitational waves, and wow. form gold in vast quantities. So certain atoms come from the merger of two objects. Other things just happen when giant stars explode as regular everyday supernovae. Now, as, as far as we can tell at this moment in the Earth's history, we aren't too close to anything that could go supernova in a potentially bad way. We are within uh, hundreds to thousands of light years of various objects that will go supernova at one point or another. The most famous are Eta Carina in the southern hemisphere, which is... Uh, part of a great star forming region and has its own amazing nebula around it. Uh, here in the Northern hemisphere, we have the star Betelgeuse. Actually, you can see that one in both hemispheres. Who am I kidding? Uh, Betelgeuse, <laughs> which someday uh, will give the constellation Orion a bloody red shoulder. Uh, the, these are stars that could go supernova in our lifetime, become daytime yeah. objects. We're just Jeez. waiting. Wow. Uh, now, looking at these objects, as near as we can tell, none of them have their rotational pole pointed directly at us, which means right. we're not in jeopardy of gamma ray bursts. Uh, we're not in jeopardy of ionizing radiation, destroying our atmosphere. We should be good. Now, yeah. the reason I say should is there could be pairs of neutron stars out there that we just haven't seen. Mm. Uh, so you always have to beware of the small compact objects that may have gone dark. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's a wild and exciting universe, but currently it looks like we're safe. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. So you'd be able to see uh, that in the, in the daytime sky. Yeah. That's how a massive an explosion would yes. occur. Yes, Goodness. for several weeks, you'd be able to see either Eta Carina or Betelgeuse during the day, if it was the appropriate wow. season for that to occur, uh, just by going outside and looking up. Now, we are all, of course, hoping that this happens when those objects are at night so that we can fully observe course, them with yeah. our telescopes <clears throat> and all their detail. But just the fact that they could be daytime objects, that they would cast shadows in the night if they did this at night. No ways. It's it's kind wow. of amazing to think about. Wow. So, so, so the time that it happened to the time that we would see it, like what is the – we would see it at the same time because it's so huge or would it take a while? It's... No, light always takes time to travel. It's, it's one of those great sadnesses of sports casting and astronomy. Uh, we've, we've all been <laughs> watching the news when there's someone off on the other side of the world and their message is getting relayed by satellite truck up to the spacecraft, down to the newsroom. And that awkward delay between the newsroom asking a question and the uh, broadcaster answering it is caused by the speed of light. It's, mm. it's caused by the signal taking as much as a second to do its round trip journey. Now, if, if we're experiencing that kind of a delay just with broadcasting to and from satellites, it's going to get a whole lot worse where we're looking at distant objects. When we communicate with the Mars rover, we're looking at 20 minutes or more of light travel wow. time for the signal to get back to us. This is why we can't wow. remote control robots on Mars. Mm. Uh, so interesting. If, and, and these are things that are hundreds to thousands of light years away. So we have to wait. These objects could both have exploded and we won't yeah. know it until their light gets here. Uh -huh. Wow, that's so wow interesting. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so I had a question from my, my brother-in-law and, and I said I would try not to butcher it too much. Um, <laughs> he, Jono, he, he, while we're talking about light, I thought it was a good time to ask you. Basically, he had a question about um, the speed of gravity. Yes. So uh, if the earth is here, there's the sun, we're being attracted gravitationally to the sun. Are we being pulled where the sun was in theory, exactly like light would take eight minutes to reach. So we're actually being pulled to that part of where the sun 
uh, was in its in its rotational orbit or whatever. Uh, and so it's not faster than the speed of light. No, as as There's far as here. we can tell. Well, so so you could have things that travel at the speed of light. Nothing is instantaneous, as far as we know. But that doesn't mean science doesn't occasionally find ways to surprise us. But in this case, it hasn't. Every experiment we've done that places limits on the speed of gravity has been consistent with gravity moving at the speed of light. This means mm. that if there is a particle explanation for gravity, if gravitons are out there and they are carrying the force of gravity, they're alongside those photons moving at the speed mm. of light. And if some alien superpowered civilization came along and vacuumed up our sun, it would take us eight minutes to both see and feel that change. For eight minutes, wow. our planet would keep orbiting, we'd keep seeing the sun in the sky, and then instantly, if both travel at the exact same speed yeah. as we're hoping and thinking, <laughs> then our planet would suddenly start traveling in a straight line instead of in its mostly circular orbit, and everything would go dark except for the emergency <laughs> generators. <laughs> oh, classic. Oh. So wh why are we talking about stars? Sorry, uh, Craig, did you want to ask another question from no, John? No, 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 no. That come just now. Oh, we'll come back to another one, maybe. Go ahead. Okay, cool. So, so why are we talking about uh, stars? I, I was reading, or I've read this book called um, Physics of the Future by uh, Michio Kaku, and uh, one of the chapters is on uh, energy, and basically he says that in the future uh, we're going to be able to get energy from the stars. And therefore, like we never, we're gonna have like a, an abundance of energy in the world, so you won't have to rely on you know other sources. Is, is that something like I don't know? You have any thoughts on or, or knowledge on or? So, so Michio Kaku's science is often indistinguishable from science fiction. Take that <laughs> how you may. Uh, with human progress the way it currently is, we we don't have an ability to. Uh, easily tap into the energy of a star other than by capturing what it radiates away. So solar power today isn't entirely effective, but it starts to get us to the point of being able to capture our sun's light. Uh, what I believe he's talking about is a future where we are a spacefaring race that has the ability to much more effectively tap into the energy of stars and utilize it in different ways. Now the question becomes, do we have some sort of a seemingly magical way of going and grabbing a cubic meter of star and carrying it around in our starship and harnessing it for energy? Or have we simply created the most effective solar sails that are pushing us around on the light pressure from stars? Have we figured out how to most effectively capture every single photon and turn its momentum into pure energy? Uh, I, I honestly think that kind of a future is far, far uh, away and maybe not entirely possible because uh, it's entirely possible we will find far more effective ways to do things mm -hmm. rather than recycling a secondary energy source. The, the way to think of this is uh, here on the planet Earth, you have certain things, whether it be specific algaes or plants that are a primary uh, energy consumer. They take the sunlight, they turn it into themselves. Then you have your happy veggie algae munchers coming along, chewing that up, and they receive less energy uh, because something always gets lost in the transition. And then you have your omnivores and carnivores coming along and now eating that thrice recycled energy and turning what was once sunlight that became a plant that got eaten by a herbivore that is now <laughs> getting eaten by a carnivore. And, and you lose energy in every single step. Stars are in the process of burning atoms through fusion in their cores and generate electricity this way. Wouldn't it be better to simply generate fusion for ourselves and mm -hmm. have that primary energy source going rather than trying to rely on starlight while in the biggest voids in our universe? Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs>
Makes a lot of sense. Totally. <laughs> and there's a, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, how do you say charlatans that are you, every week you'll see a story about uh, we've figured out how to achieve fusion reactors and that kind of thing. It's pretty crazy. Well, we we have fusion reactors. You just have to put more energy into them than they give off. Oh yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. So <laughs> we just haven't found effective fusion engines because you have to keep. And, and, yeah, yeah. There's so many issues. Yeah. But issues you can solve. Um, I just don't know how readily we can solve them on the surface of this planet. <laughs> yeah. I, I had a question about. Um, I've read about active black holes and that kind of mm-hmm. thing does that imply that you get a, a non-active black hole and and how would that work either you have in my mind if you've got a black hole you don't it's like how does it be active or not so so the catch here is active refers to whether or not the black hole is hap- happily munching on material not to whether or not oh, it exists i understand so you. you can have a rogue black hole happily floating undetected through our galaxy. And because it's not actively eating anything, we don't see any light emanating from it. Uh-huh. Generally, when we detect black holes, it's because they're either in the center of a galaxy and we measure the motion of objects going around them. They're in a binary star and we detect them through the motions of their uh-huh. companion going around with them. And in all of these cases where we're strictly detecting the black hole by how it yanks things to and fro, those can be perfectly boring, non-feeding, inactive black holes. Our own Milky Way has a boring, non-active black hole in its center. Now, when we look out at other objects, whether they be stellar mass black holes that are eating their companion star by gravitationally pulling off material into a disk around them, or whether it be a distant quasar that has gas and dust falling into the center of the galaxy, In these cases, the material that is falling in towards the black hole ends up forming a disk. Uh, Things in general can't fall straight in. If we tried to throw a rock at the sun, it would probably end up actually spiraling in towards the sun rather than falling straight in because of conservation Mm. of angular momentum. (laughs) When gas... And dust tries to fall in towards a black hole, it forms a disk instead. Oh, and these yeah. disks can get so hot, so dense, that they generate their own light. They create magnificent m- magnetic fields that have jets of electrons and other material coming out of them. And it is this disk of material waiting to fall into the black hole in the process of falling into the black hole that is heating up that has its own nuclear reactions going on that is generating this magnificent magnetic field it's this disk that is the active part so i guess a better way to think of it is an active black hole is one that has bothered to accessorize I'm with you. Yeah, I like that. so that's an accretion disk that you you're talking about is that what it's exactly it's an accretion disk Oh, yeah, that's so interesting. Wow. <laughs> Accessorize. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, w- one of the things um, I think that you do on your podcast is you, you basically explain things that happen in our universe uh, that you can sort of prove. And w- what are the, what are like, say, maybe like two of the most sort of fascinating things that the general public won't really know that, that you know, you could probably tell us about? Oh, man. Uh, I think the fact that we are now able to watch planets in the process of forming around young stars using the Very Large Telescope in Chile and the Atacama Large Millimeter Array Telescope, and that this process seems to take only a few thousand years would shock people. The the wow. idea that we're very rapidly forming planets, that planets finish forming before stars finish forming. Wow. That that's something that we don't think of things occurring on those time scales. Sure. No. That's incredible. So so you can get an like an Earth sized planet forming in a few thousand years. Is that is that what you're saying? You can even get a Jupiter sized planet. No ways. Yeah, yeah. And wow. and we we can see them. There was an amazing image that came out from the Very Large Telescope. I think it came out uh, today that 
you can see a Jupiter-ish planet next to a red dwarf star that's been blocked out. You can see the glowing light from the disk of, of materials still around this young star. With, with the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, we see gas disks with empty bands that have planets in them. We're watching this happen. And the people who write the computer simulations to model what's going on, depending on whose models you're following, these planets are forming in a matter of hundreds to thousands of years, depending on the density of the disk and just how big they're growing to be. Wow. That's incredible. Is it so maybe you want to... Yeah, you go, bad guy. No, but go ahead. No, no, you, you go because mine is going to be a little bit like, you know, an airy fairy question. So <laughs> no, let's, let's hit it. But <laughs> so, so, I mean, one question I guess everyone like likes to talk about and think about is, is other life forms, you know, like, um, mm -hmm. say aliens and things like UFOs. What are your thoughts on that? Do we put, is that sort of in the same uh, bucket as flat earthers? Or are these things that we can actually really maybe believe in? I, I think that we're pretty safe saying that there hasn't been, at least since the age of NORAD and the other military radar complexes, there hasn't been alien UFOs visiting the Earth. There haven't been probes and all those things that you sometimes hear about. But I don't think we can say one way or the other that there is or isn't intelligent life out there. It's still a belief question. Mm. We, we have this equation called the Drake equation that has a whole bunch of different variables that go into it that you need to know all the values to say what is the probability of a civilization coming into existence. It depends on how often are stars forming of the type that can have planets, how long do those stars live? How long do those planets live? What is the probability of life emerging? What is the probability of that life evolving intelligence? Right now, we're at the point where we've pretty much figured out the star part. We're starting to figure out the probability of planets existing. And this, this is new. Since 1995, mm. we've, we've discovered thousands of potential planets around other stars. And we're really just starting to look. Now, the next thing we have to figure out is what is the probability of life? And this is something that I'm really hoping we'll start to get a handle on. And I'm not talking intelligent life. I'm talking life. Mm. Uh, I'm hoping we'll start to get a handle on that within our lifetimes because we now know there's all sorts of worlds within our very solar system capable of s supporting the most extreme life forms. We have mm. the methane-rich uh, moon Titan that could support methanogens within its atmosphere. We have warm, deep seas on Enceladus, Europa, so many different icy moons. And then, of course, we still don't know what's beneath the surface on Mars. Mm -hmm. And we are finding these seasonal methane deposits, which means that there's either ices that are melting and releasing methane on a seasonal basis, or there's life beneath the surface that wakes up and farts a lot on a seasonal basis. <laughs> <laughs> Once we start to figure out how common is life forming on worlds capable of supporting water, uh, once we answer that, that will start to give us hints of how likely it is to find life elsewhere. I don't know if we'll ever be able to answer the intelligence part. I don't know. And it's anyone's guess how common it is for life to be completely obliterated by asteroids, mm -hmm. by things like the bubonic plague or the Spanish flu, how often humanity like races kill themselves off with pollution mm -hmm. or nuclear weapons or chemical weapons. We, we don't have a way to get a handle on what is the likelihood of life killing itself off. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a way to get our hands on information on how common is it for life to even evolve towards intelligence instead of towards dinosaurs? <laughs> Jeez. So in other words, you, you, in theory, you could have a, uh, many civilizations that have come about, but because, if they reach this certain tipping point, they destroy themselves. So you'd never know about them anyway. So you exactly. end up never seeing them anyway. Wow. 
I, so, I think in, in a way our best hope is detecting young civilizations that have a great deal of atmospheric pollution that we can detect at a distance. Mm. Um, I don't know if we'll ever meet anyone, but as bad as it sounds, I'm hope I'm hoping to see their coal burning <laughs> fires. <laughs> <laughs> and just while we're on that, I mean, w one of the things we were wondering about is there's so many things in the world, like let's say problems or uh, opportunities to to improve on. Uh, why do we study the stars? Why do we look so far out? What is the deeper uh, reason for that? It It's a combination of the practical and the impractical. On the practical side, the fastest computers in the world were often developed to run astronomical simulations. And this is technology that we've all benefited from. Wi-Fi exists because Australian astronomers were trying to figure out how to clean up the interference noise in their radio data. There is a lot of practical technology that comes out of our astronomical pursuits. CCD cameras that exist as CMOS cameras in everyone's cell phones. These mm. are siblings to the detectors that we use in the most powerful cool. telescopes on and above our planet. So oh. I, on the practical side, it, it challenges us to develop technologies that make life better, from weather satellites to geosynchronous uh, communication satellites. We are bringing ourselves closer to one another by sticking things in far out orbits. But beyond the practical, our, our world isn't always the happiest place to be. Uh, we can look to any continent and find things that are horribly demoralizing and may make you just want to curl up in a small ball with a cat or a dog and never look out from under your covers. Mm. And I challenge you that it's always worth looking up at the stars. Sometimes we need to dream bigger, see that everything we have in our planet is quite small, but as humans, we still have the ingenuity, the thoughtfulness, the ability to work hard and figure out how is it we got here? How did our solar system form? How will our universe end? These kinds of fundamental questions that were once strictly the parlance of poets and theologians now have scientific answers. Mm -hmm. And we sometimes do science to see something far bigger than ourselves and to get at those fundamental questions that don't make our life any better, but do satiate our curiosity. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's beautiful. I'm just, <laughs> you just satiated my <laughs> curiosity right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> um, so what are your thoughts on, you know, people that, uh, you know, that are trying to go to Mars and, you know, there's programs that are, you know, building um, places where people can probably live there in like, you know, 20 years time. Do, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, I have so many mixed emotions, so very many mixed emotions. And and the reason for my internal strife is we have very limited science dollars globally. Uh, many of the worlds of the nation that uh, once upon a time were the leaders in science and often still are the leaders in science are now also working to deal with aging populations, with the intake of refugees, with so many different social costs. And manned space flight and unmanned space exploration often share similar budgets. And one of those costs about 200 times as much as the other. Mm -hmm. And if we can spend the money that is coming from the federal government on robotic exploration, on sending science probes, on building more telescopes here on the surface of the planet that will allow us to capture the data we need for earthbound astronomers and space scientists to understand our universe. Well, we'll get a whole lot more science done if we're not having to pay to send men and women to Mars. Now, at the same time, going to Mars is 
awesome. <laughs> so I don't fault uh, any of the commercial space agencies for wanting to invest their personal money to invest money that they earn uh, launching things for a profit for the space agencies. I They are welcome to invest their dollars in as much manned space flight as they want and woman space flight and dog space flight. Send <laughs> all, all entities into space. Just don't take it out of the federal funds from all of the different <laughs> nations. I do worry, though, about the protocols. On, on one hand, uh, ESA, NASA, JAXA, all of the major space agencies, I forget the abbreviation for India's space agency, <laughs> all of these major space agencies have massive books of rules, regulations, protocols, things you have to do that guarantee that your spaceship, your humans, and your instrumentation all stay safe. And a lot of times these rules and regulations come from loss of life and injury that occurred when accidents happened. And I worry that it is possible for the commercial space agencies to rush things, to say, well, if this nation won't let me, I'll do it in this other nation. And there's a lot of pretty fundamental problems that we don't even know where to start to solve. We have to figure out radiation protection. Mm -hmm before we go to Mars. And yeah. and so it's premature to, to talk about uh, building the capsule before we know how to insulate it from deadly cancer-causing high-energy particles that kind of fill outer space. Mm. Um, <laughs> so I'd rather we don't kill anyone by accident, but uh, as long as people do things thoughtfully, Think through their consequences, cross their T's, dot their I's. Don't dot your T's and cross your I's. That's going to cause problems. <laughs> uh, as long as things are done cautiously, I really hope that all of these commercial space agencies will lead the way. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. For sure. Wow. You know, we, had a, we had a lady on our podcast not too long ago, uh, Diane McGraw. And what a, like an amazing lady. Um, and yeah. she's, she's, been, she's been part of one of the, those programs to send people to Mars in 2032. And she's now out of, I think it was 200,000 people. She's now in the last 100. And mm. um, it was really, I mean, everything that you just said now, uh, you know, like are things that she, she mentioned that they have to work towards yeah. and whatnot. And it was, yeah. it was really fascinating talking to her. And, and you know, you, you're kind of rooting for her that she definitely goes there because you can see, <laughs> you can hear and see how much she just... You know, she yeah. just loves the idea and, and um, also like wants to use science um, to improve the earth, you know. So yes. by yeah. going there, they'll have to do certain things which we can benefit from on earth, which is cool. Yeah. Similar Massive to what you were saying earlier. Recycling. Yeah, yeah the, the recycling was a big one for sure. Yeah, sustainable. Yeah, it's so interesting. Jeez. Yeah, so fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you know what? Uh, what is your plan for the next uh, while, Pamela? Are you, I mean, your podcast is going from strength to strength. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, are you giving us some talks in the upcoming weeks and months? Uh, and also tell us a little bit more about, you know, where we can find more information about you. And uh, yeah, it would be really great to hear. Well, I, as a person, can be found as Starstrider on pretty much any social media platform and uh, stream periodically on Twitch. Uh, professionally, I am the director of CosmoQuest, which is CosmoQuest X on pretty much every social media. And uh, if you just give me a follow on Twitter, I do a shout out before I start pretty much any live stream. Now, if you'd like to see me in person, I will be at the Astronomical League meeting, uh, not this weekend, but the weekend of July 15th up in Minneapolis. And later this summer, I will be traveling to Vienna, Austria to attend the International Astronomical Union meeting, uh, where I'm going to be the editor of the newspaper that we put out for the meeting. And I'll definitely be doing some European meetups there. In the fall, I will actually be traveling to Australia, where I'll be in both Melbourne and Sydney giving talks at various locations. The itinerary is still being worked on. Uh, but my main reason for going is to give a talk at the Australian National Skeptics Society meeting. Oh, awesome. And you also run 
um, alongside, uh, well, Fraser Kane, who we didn't even touch on today, but uh, you have star parties. Is that right? It, uh, is it, that still, it's true. Do you still do that? We're we're currently uh, between runs, right. uh, so for a long time we were running uh, virtual star parties where we got volunteers from all around the globe to join us on Google Hangouts with their telescopes, and it would literally give the world a eyepiece view of the sky from multiple locations around the planet. Now, the problem we ran into with this is it turns out that it is possible for clouds to hit all of our volunteers across <laughs> all the continents all at, at once. The same no way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and it became a bit of herding cats. And uh, so we wound that, wound that up for a while to try and figure out a better way to do it. And it mm. looks like we might have found it. Fraser's okay. going to be coming back working with online observatories that are uh, going to be loaned to us by the good folks at Oceanside Photo and Telescopes. That's optcorp.com. And in addition to facilitating us doing uh, all sorts of stuff with their online telescopes, we are also looking uh, to start doing, well, real world here in Edwards, Illinois, star parties with telescopes that we were sent by Oceanside Photo and Telescope. Um, unfortunately, since getting those telescopes, every time I've scheduled a star party, I, we have ended up with thunderstorms, snow, tornadoes, <laughs> no other such weather events. So I'm hoping at some point my cloudy night despair will come to an end and uh, we'll be able to start teaching anyone who tunes in exactly how to get the most out of their little telescope. <laughs> Magic. Wow. Oh, that's so cool. Jeez. Um, you know, just, you know, I, I just, today's chat has literally been, I've been grinning the whole way through. It's been like, such a childhood thing to be able to speak to someone that really knows what they're talking about, about the night sky. So, you know, just uh, from my side, thank you so much for spending the time with us and um, speaking so um, elegantly about uh, all things science and, uh, you know, it's just so ex you, you make it exciting and, and interesting. So um, thank you. We, we, we didn't even touch on citizen science, which is a big part of what you do. Uh, we didn't, to talk about your uh, favorite little thing in the world, Cepheid uh, variable stars, uh, which, you know, there's so many questions, uh, you know, untold questions we could have had for you today. But um, just thank you so much for your time and uh, keep doing what you're doing because I think uh, you hit the nail on the head. It uh, is look up to the sky, look beyond the minutiae of day-to-day -day problems and think bigger. And I think if more people did that, we would just be in a better place. So it, it creates that um, excitement about um, the bigger scheme of things in, in the world. So thanks for that. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure being on with you guys. Yeah, that's so cool. And just just a little bit from me as well. Just wow, thank you. What a what an amazing chat. So sorry, like, I'm just like, I'm often mesmerized by people that are like, so intelligent. And like, yeah. I was just say I was like, Wow, this lady is so clever. I'm like, <laughs> I'm listening to like half of the stuff I understand, half of it I'm going to have to listen to again. <laughs> but, uh, but there was like parts in it like you are a proper storyteller and, mm. you know, just with the way you talk, but also with your voice, like I, I, I want to like almost listen to it again, close my eyes and just imagine some of the stuff that you're talking about because, you know, it was so captivating and so cool. Um, you, like Craig said, you, you make it so interesting and you make it so fun. Like, you know, I mean, I'm sure you're going to have like many astronomers coming off, you know, off of this podcast yeah. because they want to go and study it now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, just such a great chat. I mean, we covered so many good things, you know, not, even, not just astronomy, but, but other things too. And we really appreciate it. Um, I know Craig is not going to stop talking about it. He's, he was grinning <laughs> like he was so happy when he messaged me like, oh, my God, she's coming on. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, so you've cool. really made, uh, you know, his day and my day, too. So we really appreciate it. And, and thank you for everything you do. Um, and, yeah, we just wish you all the best for absolutely everything in the future. Well, thank you very much. And I hope I've inspired you both to go out, go camping and yeah, look up. Definitely. Cool. Thank For you sure. so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.
Waking at dawn, packing the gear September tour and up in the air Stop at the toll, digging for change Snowy Cape Fold, mountain range Gotta be quick, so far to go 